everybody. Thank you very much for having me here today. It's an absolute pleasure to be back in Turkey. I was here recently um, in Istanbul, actually, with Startup Istanbul in October. And the environment and the determination that is constantly being shown is absolutely inspiring. So it's a pleasure to be here. I was kind of thinking of what would be the best use of your time uh, that I have with you for the next 20 minutes or so. And obviously, Sam, head of growth from HubSpot, who was just on, uh, did a brilliant example of exactly what we're trying to do. So I thought, rather than just give you some of the usual um, tools and tactics, that I actually give you a little bit of insight into um, how we think, so that hopefully you can actually copy how we think and start to become a, some kind of growth engineer yourself. And so I get to work with some very uh, diverse, unusual, exciting companies that range from best-selling authors to films to uh, tech startups and to less traditional. But what is growth hacking? Well, there's the slide uh, which was famously done by uh, Dave McClure from 500 Startups. And he basically goes through growth hacking as an extension of marketing, of not just being inbound marketing, the traditional how do we attract clients, but how do we specifically attract, retain, grow, get them to refer and increase revenue. It's critical. And I like to think of growth hacking essentially as a game of battleships. I don't know if anyone's ever played that as a, as a kid. I used to love it. And basically, we all think growth. You know, we're just going to build something. Everyone's going to fall in love with it. Hell, I fall in love with every product I've worked on. So why wouldn't everyone else? It's not as simple as that. And the reason is this. This is essentially what your market looks like. Right now, you have no idea what your growth is, what your growth channel is, how it's going to happen, and more importantly, how you're going to make it sustainable. So you have to almost work from this premise, start very small, and try and find a, one small hit that's going to actually start that traction. So one of the things that most uh, people in growth talk about is the kind of strategies that we'll use. But equally as important is the psychology behind it. And once you understand the psychology, you can come up with all the strategies that you want and test them against this. Good old Matt Damon on Mars came up with a great, with uh, the Martian obviously came up with a great quote, I'm going to have to science the shit out of this. And Sam earlier was talking about how we have to approach this in a scientific method. And what growth hackers are very good at, generally, is that we have some creative ideas, but we're also disciplined enough to enforce scientific rigor around what we do. John Egan, who's the growth engineer at Pinterest, is an example of how we actually do this. Very easy to define, but it's the skills and the psychology and the strategy behind it is the way to actually develop this for your own company. So one of the things that I always want people to try and remember is that a user is not the same, okay? Every single person in the audience now is different, right? We've all got different things happening in our lives, different psychologies, different emotions, different things that make you tick, turn you off, get you interested, get you involved, uh, alienate you, okay? Make you want to go to your uh, Twitter feed and say, Ross Kington is doing an amazing job here, okay? And everyone's different. So how do we actually start to understand that? Because it's too broad at the moment. Well, one of the things that we like to actually look at is how do we actually trigger emotion within everyone who comes to us, either positively or negatively. A lot of people tend to focus that it's got to be this massive positive experience. I'll show you a little bit later where you can actually create negative emotional experience in a market that actually drives people directly to you. So Sam earlier, he was actually talking about um, a hypothesis. And the whole idea about a science experiment is that you start with a hypothesis, an idea. Basically, I think this, and you come out with whatever X is. And you have to start with a hypothesis before you can even run a test, because otherwise, as we saw, you just firing blindly into the air, and you have no direct idea of what's going to be hit and miss. And obviously, it's very, very cost uh, prohibitive to just try everything without any real concrete basis for hypothesis. Once you have a hypothesis, obviously, you can then start to experiment, test it uh, with dynamic tension, testing it, set some initial starting conditions to try and make it as uniform as the same each time, measure the results, obviously, and then, basically, analyze the results. And I add something in at the end called confirmation bias. I don't know if this is a term that anyone is familiar with. 
is something you should really, really pay attention to. Confirmation bias is where our brains look for confirmation of anything that we're saying to be correct. Whether it's true or not, that doesn't make any difference. So as a scientist, this is something you've got to try and eliminate from how you actually approach your experiments and all of your growth potential. I think I'm making sense, but if anyone's not too sure, please come and see me at the end. So this is one of the things I talk about. How do you hack the hypothesis? How do you start with the initial idea that's going to have a good chance of success and start with the end in mind? First thing I want to bring up is that there are two forces that drive all human decision making. And this is actually based on um, more uh, Sigmund Freud psychology, but it's still true. And the essence of it is that we will always do everything we can to avoid pain and move towards pleasure. Simple as that. It sounds ridiculously idealistic, overly simplified, but if you think of every decision you make right now, you're either moving away from pain or moving towards pleasure. And each time you make a decision, you're reinforcing this. So, so some of the things that we're going to be talking about now is how do you actually leverage that? I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Robert Caldini. This is a book I recommend every marketer, entrepreneur, influencer, anyone should read. Uh, it's called Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion. It's been around for several years now. And I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Caldini. And he is the fundamental expert on persuasion and the psychology of uh, influence. And why this is important is because every single thing you're trying to do right now, if you can't persuade someone to come and sign up just to give you an email address or just to log in, you can't do anything. You might have be sitting on the next unicorn, ready to ride out of the stable into the sunset, but essentially you can't find the key to open the door, okay? This is going to help you. So one of the things that we talked about was some of his core psychological principles, of which there are six. Now, when I was talking with him, he was saying to me that the conferences that he would speak at loved the principles, but they all struggled to then take the theory and apply it directly to their industry. So this is exactly what I'm going to do today. These six core principles I'm going to give you, and I'm going to show you with all um, companies that we're all very, very familiar with exactly how it's used. And then what I want you to do is actually take away, either buy the book or if I don't get some free PDF, I'm sure it's online somewhere. Uh, <laughs> But actually take this and go and stress test your website, your app, your uh, email system, anything, any chain within your business, and just test it against these six principles. So the first one is social proof. We like to be, we're, we like to be in crowds. It's safety. Safety is in numbers. And one of the things you start to see is that I've got 47,000 Twitter followers. And so the... You know, Richard Branson, no, I'm anywhere near him, is obviously probably north of 9 million uh, LinkedIn followers by now. And this is just a very basic thing to say, look, these guys have got something interesting to say. There's this many people following them. Why aren't I? Not many people really want to be the first ones to step out of their comfort zone, be the one to stand out and say, yeah, I'm going to follow this guy. Okay? No one wants to be really the first person except for a handful of the early adopters that we discussed earlier. Social proof is incredibly powerful. I mean, even then when you start to look at um, Gangnam Style, don't worry, I'm not going to do the dance or put the video on. But the reason why it went north of, what, 2.5 billion views on YouTube, I think it was actually the first video to do over a billion, was because everyone started to see these numbers racking up, racking up, and they were thinking, why is everyone checking out this video? And our natural curiosity, our natural instinct in what is the herd mentality doing, I'll go and find out myself. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is the beauty of social proof. Social media is easy to manipulate. Why not? Take, for example, Eric Ries, the lean startup, as we were discussing. Uh, Amazon have uh, probably one of the best examples of how to use social proof to enforce decision making. And the number one predictor of what people will buy when they see a page on Amazon, regardless of what the product is, is how many five-star reviews does it have versus how many one-star reviews. So you're already saying, look, there's safety numbers. Look at all these people who gave me five, 4.5 stars for my book. It must be good. Okay, I'll give it a go. Oh yeah, it was pretty good. 
I'll leave you some, I'll leave you some love in a five-star review as well. Now, this is something that everyone can do in their website uh, with every app that they have right now. And if you look, take time to actually look and understand how people are using social proof, it's actually very clever and a lot more uh, tactical than you probably realize. If I use social proof, for example, it's not a question of do I want to uh, attract and engage necessarily, but how's that going to leverage me onto the next step of whatever I'm trying to achieve? And this is something you can do with every uh, social media account that you have today. Second, authority. This is something that's uh, incredibly, incredibly powerful that we don't actually realize how much attention it gives us. Uh, James Altucher, brilliant um, writer, author, made millions, lost millions, made money as an investor, um, and writes now a very, very successful blog. Now, his book that came out, I just cropped it slightly, but his book that came out was called Choose Yourself, and it basically looked at why you should be thinking about yourself to take yourself to the next level rather than investing in necessarily other big corporations. And the whole interesting point that I'm making with this is that he had Dick uh, Costanlo, from, who's the CEO of Twitter, write the foreword. And this was on his front page of the book as you go to Amazon. So immediately you're also thinking, I've never, I might never have heard of this guy, James Altucher. He may be pretty good. There's a load of social proof around he's got five stars for the book. But why is the CEO of Twitter endorsing him in writing, essentially, the introduction for the book? So there's enough of influence in that that it's like, okay, yeah, let's check it out, let's see. John Ronson, another fantastic author, uh, recently wrote a book which I recommend everyone reads, so I've been publicly shamed. And most people will read a book like that and they'll think, uh, it's not really for me, it's more of a social commentary. But if you understand the story behind the social commentary about our social media and how to manipulate it and how influential it is, you'll actually get a, little, a lot of insights. And what John Ronson does on the top of his books is that he piggybacks of previous uh, successful products and books that he's written. So he wrote a very, very famous book that was a, also a TED talk called um, uh, How to Spot a Psychopath, or The Psychopath Test, excuse me. The Psychopath Test proved to be very, very, very successful, very popular, and very viral. And so now what he does is on the launch of all his new books, he has, the, this is the author of The Psychopath Test. Basically, if you like the author, if you like The Psychopath Test, you'll like this book. TED, everyone knows TED Talks, right? Some of the most incredible minds out there that are coming up with real insights into moving ourselves forward. And even just being stood on the stage, any stage, okay? You've got the TED Talk, you've got Startup Turkey, you're instantly some kind of authority figure, regardless of whether you know more or less than the person in the audience or not. It's about the perception. And Twitter famously uses it with their blue tick, right? The gold dust of some people who, who look exclusively for the blue tick on Twitter and uh, automatically equate, if that person's got a blue tick, they must be a social influencer. They're worth speaking to. Scarcity. You might think it's quite difficult. This is actually very, very easy to manipulate and to develop a false scarcity that you can actually use. So take, for example, in the UK and the US, one of the, the biggest selling uh, toys this Christmas was BB-8, the Star Wars toy that rolls around on the floor and makes noises or something. And the way to actually create that scarcity anyway was that it was already being touted in the media as the most popular toy. You won't be able to get hold of it. Um, and then you go on to somewhere like eBay, and of course, they're again leveraging that scarcity because the more scarce something is, the more people desire it. Let me just say that again. The more scarce something is, the more people desire it. The more difficult it is to achieve or to reach, the more people want it. Kickstarter do this. eBay, like I say, continue, continue where they say, uh, oh, sorry, that's actually Amazon, where you can actually order something within a specific amount of time, and you can get it quicker or later. And it's a different form of scarcity that you're creating. Kickstarter are very good by saying, if you back this many number, you know, and then it's a finite deal and then it's gone. It's a nice way that Kickstarter have understood how to leverage that one psychological trait. And it's true that you can't just go around thinking we can do just like 
a little bit more than what we're doing at the moment, okay? You really have to step out of your comfort zone with what you're doing. One of the ones that people sometimes get confused about is commitment and consistency. So uh, a lot of the time people are trying to make it as simple and as easy as possible to sign up, right? Uh, API um, now has revolutionized how we're actually able to sign up, engage, and or automatically be involved with whatever product you guys have got. But think about LinkedIn. Their process for you signing up is actually pretty arduous, right? You've got to be filling out forms, you've got to be importing CVs, which they try to take the uh, pain out of. Uh, they say, do you want to learn, some, you know, what languages do you know? And they're constantly trying to get you to commit yourself to their website. And they even do a cute thing where they gamify it. And they actually say, okay, yeah, you've nearly reached, you know, you're at all, what am I, all star? At all star now, and there's still like probably a 1% bid I haven't done yet that will get me up to whatever that next level is. And so the, what they're doing here is that the person who's coming to you, the person you're onboarding, for example, is actually trying to, is actually committing themselves to you as a company. And the more that you actually pull them through the process, they'll stay with you because they're psychologically and emotionally invested in you rather than you being another zombie app that everyone just swipes through, gets to the end of their storage capacity at some point, and then goes, I never even, don't even remember downloading that, delete, you're gone. So let's just take it for a quick example with Twitter, right? Probably one of the most widely used social media, uh, although they've had some prob <laughs> problems recently, sorry, Jack. But if you look at the sign-up process, this actually reinforces what I'm talking about. So obviously at the start, it says join Twitter today on their front page. Okay, join. And then if you want, you can uh, give them your phone number. Most people actually skip past this, but Twitter like to include it in a way that says, oh, for your security, in case someone tries to hack your Twitter account. Yeah, 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 okay, thanks very much. I probably won't give you my phone number just yet. It goes on from there to choose your, new, your username. And each time you're going down this path with Twitter constantly holding your hand to be invested in them at an emotional, core, psychological level. Then the important part is that it gets to these, this kind of stage where it's then saying, you then step through a certain level of hoops, if you like, and they say, you're in. Welcome to Twitter. Boom, right, let's get you started. Let's, this is where the fun begins. So they've taken me on a path, we've invested ourselves, and now we're like, right, well, now what do we do? And then they start saying, giving you suggestions, helping you. You know, they even now can look at your uh, browsing history and actually say, oh, you might be interested in these kind of people. I don't know if that's a good thing for some of you guys or not, just saying. <laughs> and then the whole idea is that by the time it gets to the end, you've got your Twitter uh, page, profile, set up, ready to go, and it's already clean running. Now, one of the things with this is that every step in this process will have been tested. Tested, tested, tested the entire way along. So although now uh, here it's a six step process, or I think it's about seven or eight, by the time you actually get your profile set up, every one of those steps was tested, some of those steps were taken in, some of them were replaced, some of them were removed completely, some of them didn't even exist. Which is why Twitter at the very beginning really struggled to get their audience, uh, sorry, to get their members actually engaged and regularly tweeting. Liking. So Reddit, brilliant example of how they upvote. And just by showing that, hey, I really like this, upvote it, you automatically again creating social proof. And everyone says, oh yeah, this is really cool. If you like, you know, if you like Reddit, you're gonna like this. And then you can also do it actually about your brand as well. Innocent uh, drinks, innocent smoothie drinks were a startup in the UK, now owned, um, bought up by uh, Coca-Cola, I believe. And they have a very fun, interesting, young um, social media presence. And the whole ethos is around that. You don't see, obviously, the mighty conglomerate that actually owns the company, but you see this kind of wacky, friendly, hey, we're really cool, we're just like you. We're always poking fun of ourselves, you know, and they constantly um, have this um, way of making fun of themselves in a way that is very engaging. But it doesn't always have to be about, you know, oh, do you like me, do I like you? And so when I met, uh, the, this is uh, Jed York, and he's the CEO of the San Francisco 49ers, the American football team. I don't know if anyone's heard of them or aware of them. 
massive in, massive in the States. And um, I got a chance to sit down with them, um, and we talked about some stuff that they were doing. And I posted a, this picture on Twitter, specifically to engage and create a negative emotion, which you might think is a bit crazy. But what I was doing was actually just testing out, experimenting, right? Testing out how can you like just poke the bear, right? How can you actually create some kind of dynamic tension that gets people talking about you, gets people interested in you? Because people who hate you are gonna hate you. Don't even bother. People who love you, you want to embrace them. So what I did was posted this out, and within, I think it was about five hours, I had over 4,000 people hurling abuse at me. The majority were hurling abuse. There was a few nice ones, not that many. And the main reason is because the San Francisco 49ers, their American football team this season, has been doing really badly. And so by putting something up was almost provocative because Jed's trying to, you know, he's trying to make, an, uh, trying to make a difference with the, the team and with the organization. And I was like, good, good for you. I, you know, I support you. Everyone's, no one's trying to make something fail. No one's trying to build anything to fail. But I think my favorite one was um, Mike Montana, who actually said, y'all look ready to have a threesome. We didn't. But I thought, it's a nice sentiment. <laughs> Reciproc reciprocity is very, very easy to understand. I have a two-year-old son, it's called Harvey. And he comes to me, says, Daddy, Daddy, I want, uh, I want uh, uh, <laughs> a bottle. Uh, not a bottle like you or I would have, I mean like a milk bottle. And uh, so I make his bottle and I say, here you go, Harvey. And he says, thank you, Daddy. No, no, he doesn't. He says, thank you, Daddy. I say, what do you say? Thank you, Daddy, and drinks his bottle. Now, the whole point is that every time that he comes to me for a drink, um, I'm, basically, I'm basically engineering him to say thank you. I'm basically engineering him to be respectful. And so when someone gives something to you for free, you say thank you. The interesting part is how you can use it. So here, uh, Tim Ferriss, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the 4-Hour Work Week or his blog, or his podcasts, which are absolutely phenomenal. I recommend every entrepreneur to listen to them. He actually gives stuff away of great value up front straight away because he wants you to be thinking to yourself, wow, that's really cool. You gave that to me for free? That's really cool. What else do you do? And the interest has peaked. They're then influenced in a way that they want to understand more, and they'll start to delve into you. Slack, I don't think I know anyone probably here who had, doesn't use Slack in some way. And they do it as well with their free, zero price uh, introductory offer, the freemium model, if you like. But the whole time that they're doing it, they're doing it for a very, very specific reason to get you onboarded as a paying customer. And they're constantly looking at how they can actually achieve that. So just to finish up, nothing in growth is guaranteed. There is nothing that's gonna work for one person sat next to the other. Everything's gonna be different. You've got far too many complications with that. So one of the things I, I always say to people is that every single strategy that you put together, plan as though luck is against you, as if literally everything will go wrong. Carry it out to the nth degree, and then when you get that whiff of something actually working, go with it and go with it fast. Turkey, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you, and if you have any questions, just come up and see me. Thank you.